In this section, we shall work with statistics and probability. In this video, let's begin by finding patterns with descriptive statistics. Let's take an example from the previous sections. We discovered that people with higher income tend to be older. This information can have several ends. If the goal of our statistical analysis is simply to better understand the population, we could stop our analysis here and publish this result. Well, that's right, this information is quite intuitive and it's really nothing historic. But in some cases, it's worth publishing the information because it can help decision makers to work more efficiently or to bring to light a phenomenon that's worth being known by the population. Among this information, we could find such sentences. In the year 2018, one person out of nine in the world was suffering from hunger. 121 feminicides occurred in France, and the world population was 7.5 billion people. But the goal of our analysis could go beyond data description, for example, prediction. The world population is expected to be 9 million people in 2050. The hunger in the world is expected to increase because of global warming, and the number of climate-induced migrants in the world is expected to be around 250 million by 250, according to the United Nations. Prediction is not only about the future, but it can also be predicting unknown information, such as predicting what other pieces of music someone is likely to love according to some other songs he or she already listened to, or predicting if a photo shows a male or a female face. In any cases, you will need to describe your data before making any prediction. If we want to predict whether someone earns more or less than $50, the descriptive step was very useful because we realized that the age is correlated to the income. So when we will come to the point of prediction, we will be very likely to consider the age to predict the income. What do we look for when describing the data? We search for patterns. A pattern is a set of data that follows a recognizable form. For instance, when we previously displayed a scatter plot showing the temperature at midday and the temperature at 3 p.m., we saw that the data had a particular shape as all the dots were very close to a straight line. This shows a strong relation between these two variables. We can look for patterns on a single variable. It's referred to as univariate analysis. In this case, we will study the distribution of the variable. What is its shape? How much is its spread? Where is the center of the distribution? Are there outliers? This is what we did when we displayed histograms, bar plots, and box plots. We can also study the links between several variables. It is referred to as multivariate analysis. When studying the links between two variables with the scatter plot, we were performing a bivariate analysis. We can also study the similarities and differences between individuals, corresponding to some lines in the data table. Individuals are similar if the value of their variables, of attributes, are close to each other. This way, we can deduce whether certain groups are more likely to show certain attributes. Why do we search for patterns? Because it is what helps us understand the phenomenon we are studying. It can, for example, help us understand the internal functioning of some complex systems when it's only possible to observe external expression of this functioning. For instance, biologists can observe how the consumption of omega-3 by a human being helps him or her losing fat. By observing this consumption and the weight of the individuals, they can try to guess what happens inside the human body. This is called the lipolysis phenomena. Understanding a system implies understanding casual relationships between events. When observing the correlation between the two variables, we can try to guess casual relationships. But be careful, correlation does not imply causation. Usually, a third event, may it be observed or not, is the cause of the variation of the two correlated observed variables. But we can also be willing to describe a phenomenon without wanting to understand its internal functioning. It's what happens in most cases because usually the systems we study are way too complex to try to understand exactly how they work. That's what we will do with the ozone dataset when predicting the concentrations of ozone in the air. If we were a very good physicist and meteorologist, we could probably build a model by combining physical equation that tells us how a given gas reacts to temperature, humidity, etc. But this model would be way too complex for us. That's why we won't try to understand how this system works. But it's still possible to observe that ozone concentration is usually high when the temperature is high, without saying why it is like this. Later on, this observation will help us making predictions. Describing data also usually helps decision-making. 
For instance, some economical models try to determine if a given political decision can be good or bad for the economy of a country by studying the links between the decision and the effects of the decision. Once more, this model doesn't understand the internal functioning of the system because it would involve a lot of knowledge concerning the psychology of every single consumer and the functioning of all the companies of this country. This model could just study the relationships between the input variables, namely the political decision, and the output variables, some economical indicators. Decision-making can also be made after having detected something abnormal thanks to data description, such as the very high percentage of people suffering from hunger in the world. So, let's be clear about what we are going to do in the following chapters. In this section, we will deal with descriptive statistics, and then with inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics deals with the presentation, description, and summarization of datasets using graphs and measures, such as the mean, the standard deviation, etc. Description is only about what you observe, but as soon as you will be willing to predict, you will need to generalize what you observe and to introduce the notion of probability. Generalizing is modelizing. With the model, you can predict something you don't observe. We took a sample of people coming from this country and we observed that 58% of the people are women. We are doing descriptive statistics. We described what we observe. But if we want to generalize this observation, we can say, in this country, a child who is about to born have a probability of 0.58 to be a girl. Here, we introduce the concept of probability to make a prediction on an event we didn't observe. We built a model that generalizes what we observed to what we haven't observed. At the end of this section, we will speak about probabilities and inferential statistics. Inferential statistics deals with analyzing data relating to a subpopulation in order to infer the characteristics of the population as a whole.